Is there a button that you can mute me or? That'd be great. <laughs> if I have open time. Sure. Yeah, it's on. So, can you hear? No one do a change to me. I do a change to Okay, let's get started with the next session. So in this session, hey. <laughs> this is my chair. <laughs> yeah. Okay, getting started, sorry. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. So many things, just, yes, I sound like my... <laughs> <laughs> Having a moment up here. Okay. <laughs> but we're starting the session. This session, we're going to hear from two alert brokers. So hopefully, they'll clarify a little bit um, how you, as individual users, will access alerts and how your TOMS will access alerts, both from CTF now and from LSST in the future. Uh, so the first one is Chen Su. And you're going to tell us about Antares. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Melissa. So, yeah, so Antares is among many brokers. So it's one of them. And our goal is to provide a community-based high-level broker for LSD. I will explain a little bit more what do we mean about um, high-level broker. So it was originally from our national observatory and then our colleague from University of Arizona. And then as time uh, goes on, we also uh, have new partners uh, from, um, like from the Space Test Science Institute and also from NCSA in Illinois. So to start, when I was a graduate student, uh, 30 times 30 arc minute imager is called a white field imager. And I was uh, working for alerts in, uh, for transient in M31, so we need a, a lot of mosaic here. 
But you can see in the past decade, there have been a lot of white tail imager. And then in the eye of CTF, it's just a tiny part of a CCD. Uh, for beta or worse, that means we are going to uh, receive a lot of alerts. So for CTF, it could be like 100,000, even a million. And then for ST, it will be 10 million. So that means we need to um, deal with that. Um, and then to make things even more complicated, we have so many different kind of uh, variabilities and transients, as uh, Steve showed me yesterday. And on top of that, we have a very limited amount of time to react for those really interesting targets. For, for example, here, we are looking for something like uh, um, decay within few days. So you really, you really need to respond in a very timely manner. So just want to remind you, uh, traditionally what the app servers do is that they have their own small telescope to survey the sky. They got maybe a couple of uh, events per night. They can use their own resource to do follow up. At least it will not be the case in the future. So um, to make things, um, so to tackle this uh, issue, so we have uh, this um, scheme. So in the future, the uh, um, the uh, Tendermint ecosystem will be the uh, the surface send out a, a lot of alerts, and then we'll be dealing with them not by humans but by machines. So this is uh, how Antares or a broker comes in. So the idea is that just like a stock exchange, you have so many, so much information that you don't want to go through each of them. So you rely on a broker. The broker will select the ones which are more valuable for you to uh, to follow up. And then in the downstream, we have uh, towns. That's why we're all here. So towns will be talking with Antares. So from those favorable ones, um, towns will talk to um, the telescope, try to schedule the telescope for you. And then when they set a schedule, the telescope or the authorities will obtain follow up spectra or deeper images. So this is what we'll see in the near future. So just to give you a little bit more detail about what brokers or interiors will do, is that assume we got LSD, we got 10 million uh, alerts per night. So what we're going to do is that we first will get all those alerts in just in our database. We try to associate them with previous alerts. So say if they're on the same location, then we can say it's probably the same object, then we can build uh, a very uh, long time baseline light curves. Then from the light curves, we'll extract different kind of features. And also, we have a kind of external database, which is called Tarzone. So that keeps the information of all different kind of objects. Could be variables, are like RAR or CFID. Could be transient, like type 1 and supernova, or TDEs, or gamma reversed uh, afterglows. Then you can compare uh, the visual get here with Tarzone. Try to have an idea what you get from what is the uh, nature of these alerts. Then you put in different kind of filters. At the end, what we try to do is try to um, downsize this to 100 of rates of uh, rare events per night so that you can do uh, efficient follow-up. Uh, so uh, we thought by, uh, aside from the infrastructure, what we really want to do is all sense-driven. So yeah, we'll show you uh, several sense cases that uh, drive in this uh, infrastructure. So the first one is transient on demand. <coughs> which is very typical for classical scheduled telescope. Then you are scheduled for a couple of nights per, night, per month, and then you want to um, look for young transient. Then you can just go to the broker and say, okay, I'm going to have some station in two nights. Can you give me young transient within the past maybe three to five nights? And then you can do follow up. This can be also, uh, can also be very useful for like a solar telescope because right now so is using um, so it's scheduling several nights per month for the uh, for the time to it after a few nights. So this can also be very useful for that part. Uh, you probably want to do something more um, more timely. For example, like TD events. So for TD events, uh, uh, optical is not sufficient. If you really want to understand the physics, especially some TD events can launch some jet especially in the radio. So we really want to do a uh, multi-reference follow-up from X-ray all the way down to radio. So for that, you really need to trigger all those multi-reference uh, follow-up um, in a very prompt manner. 
So for that, you can also use broker and say, okay, if this some events happen to be uh, close to the center of a galaxy, a visual agent, and then given some criteria, it could be ATD, then you can you know, use those ones and then to do uh, follow up on those. Another one which is less talked about, but I think where it is really interesting, is the uh, solar system objects. So here I show one example. This is uh, Comet 29P. So it's outbursts like uh, six or seven times per year. It's read up, but we still don't know why it's uh, outburst. But besides this, there are also other interesting targets like the interstellar object or more and more. Or after two years, uh, just a few days ago, well, we capture the second interstellar object, which is the 2 Iber resolve. And uh, brokers will be uh, very useful to identify them as early as possible. And then we can do further follow up to understand the outburst, the surface composition, especially if they are from different stars. So with that in mind, now we are actively digesting the CTF alerts. And then we have some simple uh, filters or simple cuts try to give you um, kind of uh, the events or uh, the uh, supernova or TDEs or the solar system object like I mentioned before. So we have this extra galactic stream which associates alerts with external catalogs. So we have different catalogs. We have two masks. We have, uh, we have uh, the catalog from the NASA extra galactic database. We also have the NYU value added galaxy catalog and so on. So we can um, um, cross match with them and then if it's in one of the catalog, then it's very likely to be uh, extra galactic because it's associated with the extra galactic galaxy. And also, uh, if you only have like a small telescope, for example, like two to four meter telescope, which is not good enough to get a uh, spectral very, very um, dim object, uh, we also have this high skew ratio um, alert, which will give you uh, most likely very bright, so that's why they are very high signal noise ratio. So you can do follow up easily with even two meter telescopes. We have this nuclear transients close to the center of the galaxy, possibly TDEs. We also have uh, alert strings for um, solar system objects. So we're actively sending out all those strings in real time. And But some users, they might just have maybe a handful of their favorite objects. They really don't want to go to the strings. They just say, okay, I got, I know a galaxy which is so productive, give you like maybe seven or eight supernova in the past or like a recurrent nova M31, you know the position. So for that, we also have a watch list function. So just give us a list of your object, define a certain search radius, and then we'll notify you through Slack. I think everybody is leaving a Slack now, right? So you can, we will notify you on Slack right away as soon as there's alert hitting within your search radius. All right, so of course, you know, that's our plan, and they want to demonstrate how we can really realize it. So uh, within Antares, we have some scientists that are working on their, you know, favorite science object. For example, we use the strings. We have already found young supernova, especially like 1A, also a young dwarf nova in the, in the Milky Way. And this one is a recurrent uh, nova in M31. We use the watch list function, and then we got it. Uh, uh, right away, and then get a spectra using Gemini. And then it was really lucky because it's just right before Monarchia was closed. But we want to do more, so we want to do more than that. The first one, I think, if we don't do gravitational wave, then there's no point. So uh, we're trying to put in a filter. So as soon as we have the GCNs from the uh, LIGO, then we can put in a sky map, and then we can uh, retrieve all the events, all the alerts from CTF within the sky map. You can also set the card, say, okay, we only want to find new alerts. So the alerts which has been seen before the LIGO trigger, those are not likely to be the optical counterpart. So this is work in progress. We also want to do uh, machine learning. So we have a graduate student, uh, and then this is basically from uh, Daniel. Uh, it's basically from our colleague in uh, in uh, University of Illinois. So they are actively using the machine learning. So here is the probability of its likelihood to be 
so many different kind of class, and then this is when the light curve comes in. So you can see it can uh, classify a lot on the fly and then try to update it as you get more data points in the light curve. And this is one example that it's uh, successfully classified a TV events uh, merely from the light curve, not even from gradient spectra. This other thing we want to do, so when people look into different kind of alerts or transient, they want to know which one is uh, unknown unknowns. And the way to do that is that you try to sort out the ones you know, and then the ones you don't know doesn't fit to those categories, could be something which is anomalous and could be very interesting. So we are now uh, uh, implementing a statistics learning approach. So the idea is that you go to the uh, the variation in uh, the magnitude change as a function of time. Then you can see a distribution from different kind of source. For supernova, for one it could be looking like this way. For Asians, it look differently. So, and then you can also look into the colors. So this is the different color. This is G, uh, G uh, minus R. So from this, you can compare when uh, when an alert comes in. You can compare the distribution of your alert, uh, the property of your alert compared to its distribution. And then you can find out those anomalies. <coughs> so just to um, summarize, so for Antares, you have different ways to uh, to talk to Antares to get the alert you want. So we have the web portal, all those um, streams, you can see them from the web portal. We also have the Slack channel. So I mentioned about watch list, but not only about watch list, all those other in the streams we're also sending out in the Slack channel. So if you uh, subscribe to the Slack, you also see different alerts from different streams. We also send out a couple of streams of those different streams, so it's kind of uh, down streams. And then uh, if you want to do like bulk analysis of different streams, you probably don't want to go to the website and then click each of them to see the light curve. You can just subscribe to our Kapak streams and then do your own bulk analysis. In the long run, if you are interested in favorable stars, you probably don't want to deal with the real-time alerts, but you want to have a database that you can query. So we also have uh, our uh, science platform, um, Data Lab. Uh, from Data Lab, you can talk to Antares database and then retrieve all the light curve. Um, and then we are actually working with downstream systems like the solar system object. We have our colleagues have their own downstream broker. So we send out all the non-solar system to them. Then they can do further analysis, like you know, get their magnitude change, for example. So that's a uh, so those are different ways you can interact with um, Antares. Okay, so we'll talk about broker. It's not only about broker itself, but how it's embedded in the uh, time domain consistent. So uh, from a national observatory, we can provide a lot of different uh, complementing um, tools. So from the source, we have LST, and then we have uh, Antares as a broker. You can do the real-time alert filtering. But in the long term, you can also use our sense platform, uh, the um, data lab. And then downstream, you can talk to Tom. And also Tom, have this, uh, Tom can access. So from this workshop, you can access to different telescopes. But from NOL, actually, from our national observatory, you can actually get more time besides those 50 hours. You can, so uh, we have proposal every, two, uh, every six months. Then you are encouraged, if you are using Antares, you are encouraged to use all those network of observatories to do your follow-up. And because of this, so some of you may notice that we have to change our name. So now we are called NSF, National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory. So we are now one of the NSF's um, lab. So uh, if you are really interested about Antares or how to use a broker, so in this afternoon, um, we have a uh, uh, on conversation, I can show you how to use Antares. So for one, Tom has a button here for Antares, so you can just click this button and then subscribe to all those streams. So this is different from the other brokers. Other brokers, you can do a SQL query, but if you know a filter, you can use Antares to get those uh, uh, alerts from those uh, alert streams. And to make it better, you can even develop your own filters. So you don't need to have your own computing resource. You can just use Antares to do the filtering 
then subscribe to your own stream. So if you are interested, so this afternoon, uh, please join us for hands-on activity to learn how to connect to entire streams and then how to write your own filter. But we do need some, 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 some preparation. So please register to entries so you can see those alerts. And also please register to data lab so you can use that to submit a filter. Um, and that's all for me. So I was curious about your Antares, uh, write your own query for your own stream. Yes. Um, is that only using the metadata and the alert packets, or can you add cross matches to other Galaxy catalogs or other catalogs? I mean, how much, I mean, how, how flexible is that? Yeah, that's a very good question. So actually, I will show in the afternoon. So in Antares, we have alert, and then we have social catalog. And that's all in our database. So in principle, when you write a filter, you are querying the database with the cross matches. So all the catalogs are there. And then if you have like a better catalogs, we are open to suggestions. We can you know, put those catalogs so that we can make this tool more powerful. Yeah, I had a question. Um, you had all the, the alert streams that are, are, are predefined. Um, is, where is everything else? Is there a? Um, is there an anomaly stream? <laughs> yeah, we are working on that. <laughs> Doesn't fit in any of these, or I just what's 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 your thought on how to? Um... Yes. So actually, we are working on that. So our philosophy is that you can, if you can give us a filter to find out anomalies, then okay. that would be very welcome. So, and then we are now actually working. So as you can see here, this is still working progress, but we are still we are working on to finding out anomalies, and we know that's very important to to to, to um to find those unknowns. Yeah, because I mean, I, th I thought this was, was really interesting in terms of, yeah, you could get probability distributions. Or the, and do the ones, I guess a follow-up question, do the ones that are in the um, streams you have defined, are they fairly, they're, they're well-defined criteria that it have to be above whatever all these things are to be in that fit, fit particular criteria, not sort of a distribution, and then everything else you could match with things like this and get probabilities of which one it fit in? Yeah, sure. So yeah, as you say, we are using a probability distribution. So we can say at a certain level, then it doesn't fit to any of the category, then it will go to the another. But it's still like work in progress because you know different data sets require different kind of training. Right? Yeah, that's a comment. That's a follow up comment from there. I'd recommend work at the so, yeah, actually, why is by by his work? Yeah. I'm sure you said this, but everyone can get accounts, right? Totally open. Yeah, exactly. Probably. So not only the entire account, but also the Slack account, so you can get notification right away. There's no more questions. Let's thank Chinsu again. Next up is Camilo Valenzuela. He's going to tell us about Alersi. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Camilo Valenzuela. I'm a software engineer in uh, Alerce. Uh, the astronomy part is not my forte. That's because I'm not, uh, I don't have a background in astronomy. But that's why Paula is here with me. She's an astronomer in Alerce. So, what is Alerce? Alerce is a Chilean led initiative to build a community uh, broker for LST and other large survey telescopes. Our main goals are to help the study of non-moving and variable stars and transients. Uh, that's why we are doing fast, classific fast classification of transients. 
uh, variable stars and AGMs, we want to do be flexible to adapt to another uh, science, uh, another taxonomy, another data products, other telescopes, and connect uh, survey and follow up uh, resources. So the LERSI team is very diverse. We have uh, a lot of uh, machine learning people. That's why we are focused a lot in machine learning right now. Some astronomers and some computer science. We found out that engineers uh, uh, do the software part, the technical part, a lot faster than astronomers. But we need the, the help of astronomers to do the, our job. Uh, and we also have a collaboration from a lot of institutions, Chileans and from the United States. Uh, okay, so the first uh, big problem for us was to uh, start developing as an uh, engineer. So we adapted the AGI methodology to uh, this uh, scientific uh, uh, project. So daily meetings uh, are required, but the sprints are a lot bigger than uh, the normal agile methodology. There are two week sprints because not every professor has the same time uh, in these projects. They are partially on the project, so we have two week sprints. We have weekly machine learning and training sets meeting, and that's the a picture of the team. It's a little bit old, but we we haven't figured out, figured out how to update it because we have people remotely. So another big uh, idea we we started playing with is uh, to make Alerse uh, play with another uh, members of the uh, time domain uh, ecosystem. So we have brokers, we have follow-up telescopes, we can access it by Tom's. And that exploration tools like Jupyter Notebooks, Python, Aladdin, and Topcat. And brokers do classification, filtering, cross-match, and that kind of stuff. And that's it. we send it to the follow-up telescopes and the data exploration tools. And also, the users using the data exploration tools start playing with the, with the data and then send it more targets to the DOM. And we found out that the best way to do that is with API. So everyone now is started using APIs, uh, creating a standard for brokers to connect to Tom's. Uh, it's not the best idea for a really diverse uh, brokers and really diverse uh, uses of the of this data. So we found out that API are the best way to communicate all this ecosystem. And also, inside the brokers, we found out that a lot of us are making the same uh, thing. So a lot of us are doing cross-match. We are doing classification. Maybe Antares is doing filtering. So the user can achieve a better filter with uh, using two brokers or three brokers. So interoperability between brokers is really important. So the current pipeline of alerts, we get the alert stream. Then it's classified with an early classification. We use the, all the only the first stamp of the alert of, the, of an object. So the discovery stamp is used to do an early classification. And we want to do an automatic uh, follow-up. But now we are doing that manually. So we have the model classified the best candidate of, for example, supernovae. And we inspect that manually, the 100 best candidates, and we send it to TNS. We don't have a, spectro a spectroscopic follow-up because we don't have time, but if you have, we are really, that will really help. And that will make a lot of science. So we also are doing cross-match. And we are doing another uh, classification using a magnitude correction. Then we aggregate, aggregate the light curve, calculate some features, and we use that to get a late classification from the uh, whole light curve. So for example, AGMs, variable stars, and that kind of objects. We don't need to be 
uh, online. So that can make a lot of other type of science. So for the early classification, we are using deep learning, a convolutional ne neural network, uh, using only the detection stamps. So we are using one uh, alert. And the taxonomy we are using, it's really simple, AGN, supernovae, supernovae, viral stars, asteroids, and bogus. And we are preparing the paper, so we, I can't discuss more about the architecture of the convolutional neural network we are using, but uh, that's what we are using. So, for example, why are we using the, only the first detection? Because, for example, Ample is using two detections to uh, generate an alert, an alert to TNS that, the, that is a possible candidate of supernovae. We are using just one. So that gives us the advantage that the time between our uh, submission to TNS is in a median 6.8 hours because we use uh, manual inspection of the of the candidates and the other um, uh, the other submissions are in between uh, 4.5 days so we gain like three days before another team send that uh, same report of an object uh, and we are really late for the spectra so we need to get spectra before uh, that to get more information for that supernovae. And as Matthew showed, we have uh, now classified uh, 57 supernovae. Um, almost all are supernovae 1A. This is uh, spectroscopically classified. And we got lucky and we got a TB. That was a lucky shot. But uh, and the late classification, we are using a more complex taxonomy. This is what we want. That's the taxonomy that the Chilean and the US community start working on. The classes on blue are the one we have currently on our uh, late classifier. Uh, a lot of supernovae, uh, variable stars, and uh, now we got AGNs also. Uh, and the classifier, the late classifier, use a random forest uh, over the whole light curve. So we calculate features, add the features, we use random forest, and we got uh, a really good uh, estimation between the, that big group of classes that are stochastic, transients, and periodic. We divide it like that. We got a lot of work to do in, in some areas, but the, the work is there. So what data products we have? As I mentioned, we have a lot of develop on API. So we have an API to access or ZTF uh, aggregated data uh, with the classification, the early classification and the late classification, a uh, service to get the hour or the stamps and a service to do concert and cross match using CATS HTM uh, software. So we have a provisionary doc documentation, and we also uh, start working on a Python client to access the API. We have a, a auto stream of Kafka for both classifications, but we haven't put it on the a a API, the, uh, the Python client, so we are not public in that way. Uh, we have two data exploration web pages, one more general, that is for every kind of science, to see the light curve and another type of information, and one specific to supernova. So this is the part I didn't want to go, but now I want to do a demo. I don't know if the, the screen is sharing. But, uh -huh. okay, this is the Supernova Hunter. It's showing the, the 100 best candidates given by the model, the Supernova candidates given by the model, the last 48 hours. 
So if we go here, we can see the last 24 hours. And if we select one, we have uh, some positional information with Aladdin, the discovery stamps used to get the score, and the, uh, some uh, information about the alert, and some other cross-match information. So this is uh, what we use to select the candidate sent to TNS. So Francisco, if you know him, uh, he checks every morning these 100 candidates and sends the best ones to TNS manually. And for example, this one goes to the another web page. This is the, the general purpose uh, web page. We have, for example, the light curve with the detections and no detections. If we zoom in here, for example, and I click one. We can change the stamps, selecting one point, for example. And <coughs> we have the early classification of that object. It says like a 100% supernova. So if we go, yeah, OK. So if we want to do, for example, uh, variable stars uh, uh, astronomy, we can select the late classifier. That's the random forest. And go, for example, to Alira. And we search them. Uh, we have 4,600 uh, Lyras in uh, classified with the random forest. If we select one, we can see the same information, positional information, the random forest um, probabilities. And we have, for example, cross match with some catalogs. Chumas, Decals, Gaia, and also we can follow the light curve. We can follow the light curve and see the uh, LIDAR folder. So a lot of information. If we change another object, we can see the same information. And also we can download the the whole light curve and the stamps. So that's the demo. I don't want to go more deeper into the clients and that kind of stuff, but this is pretty. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it says it's, uh, something similar. So uh, Alerce, the idea of Alerce is a broker for CTF and LSST, another large telescope. We have an interdisciplinary team and a lot of young developers uh, trying to do a distributed and scalable system because uh, we are, currently we are, uh, we are, really uh, thinking about how to scale ZDF, how we process ZDF data to LST. That's a big problem. So another uh, part is connecting with transient and variable communities to do effective follow-up. Uh, and we have a lot of products. Uh, a lot of them are currently developed, but they are still public, so you can use it. Uh, and we are learning from CTF to prepare to LSST. That's alert. So the project is really nice. Uh, what? I'm a bit surprised about is the one detection trigger yeah. you have. So, for example, well, usually first detection of like a supernova is weak. So mm -hmm. uh, I would ask about, let's say, the signal to noise maybe of a detection that you want, and how can you not be flooded by moving objects? So uh, 
ZTF gives us a moving object information. So we filter first with that. And then we use the classificator to you to see if the object is really a supernovae. So we we pass first the ZTF filter that gives us the asteroid information, for example, and then we use the the classifier. Uh, Paula can. <laughs> We are also included in the classifier the asteroid class. So we can detect asteroids with the early classifier. And we have some results, but we, can, we can't share that now. But uh, actually, as a product of this classifier, uh, the asteroid community can also study uh, sources from CTF, this kind of sources from CTF. And regarding the signature noise, we are using the alerts provided by CTF. So they are already have passed the five sigma uh, filter. So we are confident. Here, I also want to say that was a pretty impressive demo. Nice work. Um, and then I guess, yeah, my question was about the classifiers. Are you guys are writing those? Yeah. That's in-house? Okay. Is there any uh, possibility for people to uh, upload their own? Is that yeah. To upload your own classifier? Currently, no. But maybe it's a good feature to, to have it. Yeah. Yeah, I also wanted to ask about this classifier because it uh, um, seems very impressive that you can classify it. So that the early one is just supernova, variable star, and. Yeah. ATN, um, uh, Bogus, and Asteroid. And, yeah. Okay, right. So I noticed, though, that of the supernovae that you reported to the TNS, you said like 50 out of 57 were type 1As or something like that? No. It turned out to be? Type oh, yeah. Uh, so, they're like 35 Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, then that makes more sense. I was worried that like you were only classifying type 1As as super heavy. I don't think no. That, but it seems like. This is about the right proportion. Yeah. yeah. Right. But I, I'm asking, so like, have you checked that the things being classified as supernovae by your early classifier are like include all types of supernovae in the yeah. correct? Yeah. The, the thing is that with the early classifier, we cannot separate the classes. Right. So with the with the late classifier, we are working on that, uh, trying to separate. But with early, we just can say it's a supernova. Right, but there, but it's not biased towards a certain type of supernova. Uh, it's not like type 1B is getting, getting lumped in with. No. Well, it's some, I think it's something that we have to test because the training set is dominated by the type 1As. Right, that, exactly. That's but we are working on uh, doing the experimentation to improve that. So that's why, that's why it's still a in prep uh, project. So you, you have to wait for the final answer. Well, yes. Yeah. I, I, actually, that's what it's doing. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So it's classifying in real, real time, but then we wait to the next day to to see it manually. So the, we can send the stream live, uh, live but uh, without the human interaction, uh, we don't send it to the NSA. Uh, what we, they have shown before that um, for example, the rapid classifier that is classifying mm -hmm. uh, transient in real time. Mm -hmm. You have something like a score yeah. that is changing over time. Yeah. For the late classification, it's changing over time. For the early classification, it's just one because it's the, uh, the, the score is done. So, yeah. And you're using random forest? For the late classification, yes. yes. For the early, no. More questions? I have one question. Does Alersi take um, classifications from the TNS and apply them to the objects that are in your database? Yeah. Yeah, we're doing yeah, you do that. Yeah, okay. we're doing trust match with uh, TNS for that. Yeah, so I could go to, onto Alersi and search for like all the one A's that have been classified on the yeah. TNS, and then yeah, yeah. Well, you can you can search for cross matches in the. Yeah. In the general website. Also, we just for 
to look pretty. We this is slow. This part is slow, but we are checking PNS for our cl uh, classified supernovae, and it's slow. <laughs> Let's wait. So I'll give you better. So there are our uh, supernovae for PNS, but we also are doing cross match with PNS. Okay, excellent. So if I wanted just to get alerts on one A's that were a year old and then reappeared yeah. again, I can yeah. do that. Anyone else want to ask a last question? Sorry? Ah, um, yeah. Ah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, there is an application for uh, Universidad de Concepcion. They are open for also astronomers. So if you have experience working on machine learning and data science and you're an astronomer, you are uh, invited to apply. But you can find more information. I think in the WES website. Yes, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but you can ask me if you, if you want more information. I can ask. Okay. If that's it, let's uh, thank the Alerstie team again. Uh, that's it for this session. Remember to fill in your pitch slides over the lunch break if you have time, and then we'll present them later today. And other reminder to come back at 2 p.m. after.